Sentences, Book 4 by Peter Lombard. Excerpts, translated by Elizabeth Frances Rogers, 1892 to 1974. Published in 1917. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Beginning on page 78. Note on the translation. Distinctions 1 through 26, earlier chapters of the fourth book of Peter Lombard's Sentences, which deals with the sacraments, has been translated from the Latin in the hope that they may be of use to some readers. My work has been painstakingly criticized and corrected by Dr. Louise R. Loomis, but I only am responsible for its errors, especially in the few passages where I venture to disagree with her. Poententia has been translated penance throughout, in accordance with Roman Catholic usage. Res presented much more serious difficulties. In the end, it was translated in nearly every case, thing, and it has been left to the reader to learn the content of the Latin word. Other translations were suited to only a few uses of the word or else seem to interfere with accepted philosophic terms. The only other alternative was to leave it untranslated, as Harnack does in his History of Dogma. The biblical references and quotations are according to the Douay version, which in some cases differs from the King James Version. Translation of Book 4 Distinctions 1 through 26 of the Quartar Libre Sententiarum of Peter the Lombard. Distinction 1, Part 1, 1 of Sacraments. The Samaritan who tended the wounded man applied for his relief the dressings of the sacraments, just as God instituted the remedies of the sacraments against the wounds of original and actual sin. Footnote, Luke 10, verse 30, end footnote. Concerning the sacraments, four questions first present themselves for consideration. What a sacrament is, why it was instituted, wherein it consists, and how it is performed, and what the difference is between the sacraments of the old and the new covenants. 2. What a sacrament is. Quote, a sacrament is the sign of a sacred thing. Parenthesis, res. Footnote. See Augustine 10 de Civ D C5 and 2 Contra Adversar. Legate et Prof. C9 N34. End footnote. However, a sacred mystery is also called a sacrament, as the sacrament of divinity so that a sacrament may be the sign of something sacred and the sacred thing signified. But now we are considering a sacrament as a sign. So, quote, a sacrament is the visible form of an invisible grace. End quote. Footnote. Berengar de Sacra Coena. See Augustine 3. Question in Pentateuch. Q84. End footnote. 3. What a sign is. Quote, but a sign is the thing, parenthesis res, behind the form which it wears to the senses, which brings by means of itself something else to our minds. Footnote. See Augustine 2 de Dr. Christ. C1 N1. End footnote. 4. How a sign and a sacrament differ. Furthermore, some signs are natural, as smoke which signifies fire, others conventional, and of those which are conventional, some are sacraments, some not. For every sacrament is a sign, but the converse is not true. The sacrament bears a resemblance to the thing of which it is a sign. 
for if sacraments did not bear a resemblance to the thing of which they are the sacraments they could not properly be called sacraments for a sacrament is properly so called because it is a sign of the grace of god and the expression of invisible grace so that it bears its image and is its cause sacraments therefore were not instituted merely in order to signify something but also as a means of sanctification for things which were instituted only to signify are signs only and not sacraments such as the sacrifices of flesh and the ceremonial observances of the old law which could never justify those who offered them because as the apostle says the blood of goats and of oxen and the ashes of an heifer being sprinkled and sanctify such as are defiled to the cleansing of the flesh but not of the spirit see hebrews nine thirteen now this uncleanliness was the touching of a dead body wherefore augustine by that defilement which the law cleanses i understand merely the touching of a dead body since any one who had touched one was unclean seven days but he was purified according to the law on the third day and on the seventh and was cleansed so that he might enter the temple the legal observances also cleansed sometimes from bodily leprosy but no one was ever justified by the works of the law as says the apostle even if he performed them in faith and charity see romans three twenty galatians two sixteen see also romans five fourteen quote, adam who is a figure of him who was to come End quote. End footnote. why because god has ordained them unto servitude not unto justification so that they might be types of something to come wishing that these offerings should be made to him rather than to idols they therefore were signs yet also sacraments although they are often called so incorrectly in the scriptures because they were rather signs of a sacred thing than availing anything themselves these moreover the apostle calls works of the law which were instituted only to signify something or as a yoke see romans three twenty galatians two sixteen acts fifteen ten five why the sacraments were instituted the sacraments were instituted for a threefold reason for humility instruction and exercise for humility so that while man by order of the creator abases himself in worship before insensible things which by nature are beneath him through his humility and obedience he may become more pleasing to god and more meritorious in his sight at whose command he seeks salvation in things beneath him yet not from them but through them from god for instruction also were the sacraments instituted so that the mind might be taught by what it sees outside in visible form to recognize the invisible virtue which is within for man who before sin saw god without a mediator through sin has become so dulled that he is in no wise able to comprehend divine things unless trained thereto by human things likewise the sacraments were instituted for exercise because since man cannot be idle there is offered him in the sacraments a useful and safe exercise by which he may avoid vain and harmful occupation for he who devotes himself to good exercise is not easily caught by the tempter wherefore jerome warns us quote, always do some sort of work that the devil may find you occupied end quote. Quote, there are moreover three kinds of exercises one aims at the edification of the soul another aims at the nourishment of the body another at the destruction of both end quote. and inasmuch as without a sacrament to which god has not limited his power 
he could not give grace to man he has for the aforesaid reasons instituted the sacraments Quote, these are two parts of which a sacrament consists namely words and things words as the invocation of the trinity things as water oil and the like page ninety one distinction three part two five of the institution of baptism as for the institution of baptism when it began there are various opinions some say baptism was instituted when christ told nicodemus unless a man be born again of water and of the holy spirit see john three five c f hugh of st victor two de sacraments page six c four others say baptism was instituted when he said to the apostles go ye teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit see matthew twenty eight nineteen but this he said to them after the resurrection in his instructions for the calling of the gentiles while before his passion he had sent them two by two to preach in judea and to baptize with the words go not aside unto the ways of the gentiles see matthew ten verse five at that time therefore was baptism instituted because they then both preached and baptized if now we are asked under what form the apostles then baptized we can surely reply in the name of the trinity that is under the form which they baptized the gentiles afterwards for we can understand that it was given them before the passion although it is not so recorded christ did not therefore first give them this form when he sent them to evangelize the gentiles but rather the form which he had given before when he sent them into judea he afterward repeated when he sent them to the gentiles accordingly it is more fitting to say that the institution was established when christ was baptized by john in the jordan which he arranged not because he wished to be cleansed since he was without sin but because by the contact of his pure flesh he bestowed regenerating power on the waters so that whosoever was afterwards immersed with the invocation of the name of the trinity might be cleansed from sin at that time therefore the baptism of christ was instituted by which the trinity whose mystery therein was made known baptizes a man within page ninety five distinction four part one one of those who received the sacrament and the thing parenthesis res and the thing and not the sacrament and the sacrament and not the thing here we must say that some received the sacrament and the thing some the sacrament and not the thing some the thing and not the sacrament all infants receive the sacrament and the thing at the same time who are cleansed in baptism from original sin although some deny that sins are forgiven to children who are about to die and support this opinion by the word of augustine sacraments accomplish what they symbolize in the elect only they do not understand that this must be interpreted that while the sacraments accomplish remission in others they do not do it for them unto salvation but only for the elect for that in baptism sin is remitted to all infants augustine clearly says quote, from the newborn infant to the decrepit old man just as no one is debarred from baptism so there is no one who does not die to sin in baptism but infants to original sin only adults however to all sins which they have added to original sin by evil living End quote unless the enormity of their life prevents some also who are baptized with faith receive the sacrament and the thing now to page one hundred and twelve distinction six three 
that no one may be baptized in his mother's womb we must also understand quote, that although immersion is performed three times on account of the mystery of the trinity yet it is counted only one baptism End quote. jerome two commentary on epistle ad ephesians four five c iodum modo et one we are also not to be ignorant that no one can be baptized in his mother's womb even if the mother be baptized wherefore isidore quote, those who are in their mother's wombs cannot be baptized because he who is not yet born according to adam cannot be born again according to christ nor can we speak of the rebirth of one whose birth has not preceded it also augustine no one can be born again before he is born but if jeremiah and john the baptist be cited against this opinion because they were said to be sanctified from the womb as also some think was true of jacob we say that if they there received sanctification as inward cleansing it must be held among the miracles of divine power as augustine says speaking ambiguously about this if he says the use of reason and will was so far advanced in that boy that within the mother's womb he could already know and believe a thing that only age makes possible in other children it must be held among the miracles of divine power not taken as typical of human nature for when god willed it even an ass spoke also concerning jeremiah it is said before thou camest out of the womb i sanctified thee but that sanctification by which we are made the temple of god is only for the reborn for unless a man be born again of water and of the holy spirit he cannot enter the kingdom of god no one is born again unless he is already born wherefore this sanctification can be received according to predestination here he seems to speak doubtfully when he says it is not said that the infant believed in the womb but that he leaped nor did elizabeth say he leaped in faith but he leaped in the womb and this sanctification could be the sign of greatness recognized by the older person but not comprehended by the child he speaks without assertion of this sanctification not defining just how the sanctification is to be understood whether it be the sign of something to come or the truth of the justification accomplished by the spirit but it is better that we say that these two jeremiah and john were justified in the womb contrary to the common law and aided by grace all sins were forgiven them this is also taught by many testimonies of the saints page 122 distinction 7 six of the sacrament and the thing parenthesis res now let us see what is the sacrament and what the thing parenthesis res quote the sacrament is the visible form of invisible grace the form therefore of the bread and wine which appears here is the sacrament that is the sign of a sacred thing because it calls something to mind beyond the appearance which it presents to the senses therefore the appearances keep the names of the things which they were before namely bread and wine seven that the thing res in parenthesis of this sacrament is twofold moreover the thing res of this sacrament is twofold one what it contained and signified the other is what it signified but not contained the thing contained and signified is the flesh of christ which he received from the virgin and the blood which he shed for us the thing signified and not contained is the unity of the church in those who are predestined called justified and glorified 
See First Corinthians eleven twenty three. This is the twofold flesh and blood of Christ. Wherefore Jerome quote, in two ways says he are the flesh of Christ and his blood understood either the flesh which was crucified and buried and the blood which was shed by the lance of the soldier or that spiritual and divine body of which he himself says my flesh is food indeed and my blood is drink indeed and unless ye eat my flesh and drink my blood ye have not life in you see john six fifty six and fifty four therefore three things are to be distinguished here the first which is the sacrament only the second which is the sacrament and the thing quotations res and the third which is the thing and not the sacrament the sacrament and not the thing is the visible form of bread and wine the sacrament and the thing is the very flesh and blood of christ the thing and not the sacrament is his mystical flesh furthermore that visible form is the sacrament of something twofold because it signifies two things and bears the express likeness of two things for just as bread more than any other food restores and sustains the body and wine gladdens and inebriates man so the flesh of christ spiritually restores and sustains the inward man more than any other graces wherefore my chalice which inebriateth me how good it is see psalm twenty two verse five the visible form bears also a resemblance to a mystical thing which is the unity of the faithful because just as one loaf is made from many grains and wine from many grapes flow together so ecclesiastical unity is composed of the many persons of the faithful wherefore the apostle we being many are one bread and one body see first corinthians ten seventeen wherefore augustine the church is called one bread and one body because just as one loaf is composed of many grains and one body of many members so the church of many faithful is bound together by uniting charity this mystery is our peace and unity christ consecrated at his table he who receives this mystery of unity and does not keep the bond of peace receives this mystery not for himself but against himself and of this unity also christ's own body received from the virgin is the sacrament because as the body of christ was composed of many very pure and immaculate members so the society of the church is composed of many persons freed from the stain of sin as a type of this unity the ark of the lord was made of sedum wood which does not decay but is like white thorn see exodus twenty five ten page one hundred and thirty four distinction eleven part one one of the manner of conversion but if any one asks what the nature of that conversion is whether of form or of substance or of some other part i am not able to define i know however that it is not of form because the appearances of the things remain what they were before and the taste and weight to some it seems to be a change of substance for they say that the substance is so converted into substance that the latter becomes the former in essence with this opinion the foregoing authorities seem to agree but others make the following objections to this opinion if the substance of bread they say or of wine be converted into substance into the body or blood of christ a substance is daily made the body or blood of christ which previously was not and today there is a body of christ which yesterday was not 
and daily the body of christ is increased and formed of material of which at its conception it was not made to these we can reply as follows that the body of christ is not said to be made by the divine words in the sense that the very body formed when the virgin conceived is formed again but that the substance of bread or wine which formerly was not the body or blood of christ is by the divine words made this body and blood and therefore priests are said to make the body and blood of christ because by their ministry the substance of bread is made the flesh and the substance of wine is made the blood of christ yet nothing is added to his body or blood nor is the body or blood of christ increased page one hundred and fifty one distinction fourteen part one one of penance and why it is called penance next we must discuss penance penance is needful to those who are far from god that they may come near for it is as jerome says the second plank after shipwreck because if any one by sinning sullies the robe of innocence received in baptism he can restore it by the remedy of penance the first plank is baptism whereas the old man is laid aside and the new put on the second penance by which after a fall we rise again while the old state which had returned is disdained and the new one which had been lost is resumed those who have lapsed after baptism can be restored by penance but not by baptism a man is allowed to do penance often but not to be baptized often baptism is called only a sacrament but penance is called both a sacrament and virtue of the mind for there is an inner penance and an outer the outer is the sacrament the inner is the virtue of the mind and both are for the sake of salvation and justification but whether all outer penance is a sacrament or if not all what is to be classed under this name we shall investigate later with penance began the preaching of john who said do penance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and what the herald taught the truth afterwards preached beginning his discourse with penance see matthew three two and also matthew four seventeen page one hundred and sixty five distinction fifteen five what alms are for alms are a work of mercy as is most truly said have pity on thy own soul pleasing god they do not therefore deceive themselves who think that by abundant alms of their fruits or of their riches they buy themselves impunity and continue in their sins for they so love that they desire to remain in them but he who loves iniquity hateth his own soul and whoever hates his own soul is not merciful to it but cruel certainly by loving it according to the world he hates it according to god if therefore he wishes to give it alms through which it may be made clean let him hate it according to the world and love it according to god by the alms which a man owes first of all to himself the inner man is cleansed christ exhorts us to this and says make clean the things that are within for nothing is clean to the unclean but their minds and consciences are polluted as the apostle says but all are unclean whom faith does not cleanse by which we believe on christ and of this it is written cleansing their hearts by faith but lest it seem that christ rejects the alms which are offered of the fruits of the earth those he says ought to have been done that is judgment and love of god and the others not omitted that is alms of earthly fruits page one hundred and seventy seven 
Distinction 17, Part 1. 1. Whether sins are forgiven without confession. Here arises a question that has many parts. For first we are asked whether without satisfaction and confession of the mouth, by contrition of the heart only, sin may be forgiven anyone. Secondly, whether it suffices for anyone to confess to God without a priest. Thirdly, whether confession made to a faithful layman would be valid. On these points even the learned are found to think differently, because the doctors seem to have taught varied and almost contradictory views about them. For some say that without confession of the mouth and satisfaction of deed, no one is cleansed from sin if he has time for doing these things but others say that before confession of the mouth and satisfaction through the contrition of the heart sin is forgiven by god if however the sinner has the desire to confess wherefore the prophet i have said i will confess against myself my injustices to the lord and thou hast remitted etc see psalm thirty one verse five which Cassiodorus explained, saying, I have said, that is, I have determined within myself that I would confess, and thou hast remitted it. Great pity of God, who hast remitted the sin for the mere promise. For the promise is accepted for the deed. Also Augustine, not yet does he make it known, but he promises that he will make it known, and the Lord remits it because to say just this is to make something known in the heart not yet is a voice in the mouth but that a man may hear the confession and god hears also the sacrifice of god is a troubled spirit a contrite heart etc elsewhere we also read that whatever hour a sinner turns and laments he shall live in life and shall not die it does not say he confesses with his mouth, but turns laments. Wherefore we are given to understand that even though the mouth be silent, we may sometimes obtain pardon. Hence the lepers also whom the Lord commanded to show themselves to the priests were cleansed on the way before they reached the priests. By this it is indicated that before we open our mouths to the priests, that is, confess our sins, we are cleansed from the leprosy of sin. Lazarus was also not first led out of the tomb, and afterward awakened by the Lord, but was awakened within, and came forth alive, that the awakening of the Spirit might be shown to precede confession. For no one can confess unless aroused, because confession by one dead as by one who is not does not exist therefore no one confesses unless aroused but no one is aroused except he who is absolved from sin because sin is the death of the soul and as the soul is the life of the body so its own life is god from these and many other authorities it is proved that before confession or satisfaction sin is forgiven upon contrition alone and those who deny it find it hard to explain these authorities and they introduce the testimony of other authorities for the overthrow of this opinion and the support of their own for the lord says through isaiah tell thou thy iniquities that thou mayest be justified see isaiah forty three twenty six also ambrose no man can be justified from sin unless he has first confessed the sin itself. He also says, Confession frees the soul from death. Confession opens paradise. Confession gives the hope of salvation, because he does not deserve to be justified who is not willing to confess his sin in this lifetime. Confession frees us, which is done with penance. But penance is the grief of the heart and the bitterness of the soul for the evils which each one has committed. Also John, 
no one can receive the grace of god unless he has been purified of all sin by the confession of penance and by baptism footnote chromotatius question mark c non posti quis forty one ibid End footnote. also augustine do penance as it is done in the church let no one say to himself i do it secretly because i do it before god god knows who has pardoned me because i do it in my heart then without cause was it said what thou loosest on earth shall be loosed in heaven then without cause were the keys given then we make vain the word of christ job says if i have blushed to confess my sins in the sight of the people also ambrose the guilt is venial which is followed by confession of sins also augustine on this passage of the psalm let not the deep swallow me up and let not the pit shut her mouth upon me says the pit is the deep of iniquity into which if thou hast fallen its mouth shall not close upon thee if thou dost not close thy mouth confess therefore and say out of the depths have i cried unto thee o lord etc and thou shalt escape it closes upon him who has despised it in the depth from whom in death just as from one who is not there can be no confession also no one receives pardon for a more grievous debt of penalty unless he has paid some kind of penalty even if much less than he owes for so the liberality of mercy is granted us by god that the justice of discipline be not neglected also jerome let him who is a sinner lament his own sins or those of the people and let him enter the church from which he had wandered on account of sin and let him sleep in sackcloth that he may compensate by austerity of life for the earlier pleasures by which he offended god by these and other authorities they endeavor to prove that without oral confession and some payment of penalty no one can be cleansed from sin what therefore is to be thought about these things what believed it can certainly be said that without confession of the mouth and payment of the outward penalty sins are effaced by contrition and humility of heart for from the moment any one proposes to confess being pricked in conscience god forgives because there is there the confession of the heart though not of the mouth by which the soul is cleansed within from the stain and contagion of committed sin and the debt of eternal death is relaxed therefore that which was said above regarding confession and penance should be referred either to the confession of the heart or to inward punishment just as this saying of augustine that no one obtains pardon unless first he has paid some small penalty for his sin must be understood of the external penalty and applied to the scornful or negligent just as this let no one say i do it secretly etc for some neglect to confess sins in their lifetime and are ashamed to do it and therefore do not deserve to be justified for just as inward penance is enjoined upon us so also confession of the mouth and outward satisfaction if we have the opportunity wherefore he is not truly penitent who does not have the desire to confess and just as remission of sin is the gift of god so penance and confession by which sin is wiped out cannot take place save from god as augustine says now he says he has the gift of the holy spirit who confesses and repents because there cannot be confession of sin and compunction in man of himself 
for when any one is angry at himself and dissatisfied with himself it is not without the gift of the holy spirit therefore a penitent ought to confess his sins if he have time and yet before confession of the mouth if there is the promise in the heart forgiveness is extended to him End of the Sentences of Peter Lombard, Book 4, Sacraments, Excerpts, translated by Elizabeth Francis Rogers, 1892-1974, published in 1917.